The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back and Happy New Year 2023 if you are listening to this right when it's released. Today we have an incredibly experienced guest on with us. Her name is Amukta Mahapatra. She was trained way back in the day in Montessori in 1973, and that's for three to six-year-olds with IMTC, and that's Indian Montessori Training Courses. That was an AMI course done by A.M. Justin and S.R. Swami. Hope I'm pronouncing those two right. But those people were both trained by Maria Montessori herself. So that should give you a sense of how far back Amukta goes. Uh, Some 20 years later after that, she also received her elementary level Montessori training. Uh, She also had different types of training education wise. Uh, If you're interested, a lot more to look at. But she has done so much um, from, you know, teaching in schools, directing schools, founding schools, running a training center now. And I mean, it goes on and on. Her resume is 12 pages long. No joke. Uh, Over the decades, she has also published I mean, countless articles, given countless talks, received endless awards you could read about, uh, all that good stuff. But what probably matters most, and in talking with her and just reading about her and learning about her, I'd say it's her direct work with the children of India. And that's both in urban and rural settings. I mean, from the suburbs to the slums, I mean, literally. Um, Again, I will share at the end where you can learn more about this ridiculously experienced woman. But for now, I'm interested in what she has to share that may aid all of us as parents and teachers. And, you know, when Amukta and I first connected, we actually had planned to have a pretty in-depth conversation about a serious and deep topic, how Montessori children develop up from sensorial experience to abstract learning. But as we got to talking, we kind of went in many directions, as you will hear in a moment. So I think of this conversation as a look into Montessori learning uh, with a woman who has kind of seen it all through the years. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, I surely did. One quick note, when Amukta says pre-primary, that refers to the Montessori Casa classroom or ages roughly three to six. I'm saying this here because in American Montessori schools, ages three to six is sometimes referred to as primary. Uh, confusing. Um, This is the difference between all sorts of different countries and how they refer to uh, ages in schooling. Again, on this episode, pre-primary equals ages three to six, that environment, unless noted otherwise while we're chatting. All right, let's get into it. Here is Amukta Mahapatra. We've got a very interesting topic. We're going to dive into kind of the real, the deep stuff with Montessori, but I thought before we get into the serious nitty gritty I always like to get a sense of, do you have any specific memories in Montessori, whether from your early days or even up to now, where what we're going to be talking about, that kind of development up, you've experienced Mm -hmm. it firsthand and it's kind of really, you know, it's really fresh Mm -hmm. in your mind or something really for the audience to understand it all. Yeah. Uh, A nephew of my my sister's uh, son was uh, going to a Montessori school and she wanted to take him out after a, you know a year or so, but I said just keep him for a little more time at least. And so she did that. So once we were sitting in the, you know, having a family kind of uh, chat, he was uh, sitting, putting his head on my lap, and his uh, legs were on the wall. Mm-hmm. And suddenly he said, you know, see that triangle over there. You know, I was wondering which triangle I was looking all around. And uh, then he said that he showed the space, the space between the floor and his legs and the wall, which made a triangle. You know, so it was amazing. He was just about three and a half years old and pointing to that space between them, you know. Yeah. So I feel that uh, was amazing. And uh, to see empty space as, you know, a shape. 
Yeah. And I felt he was going towards abstraction. So I, it's now, the next step after the third, you know, the third yeah. set of triangles. I, I have a feeling we're going to dive into so much because I have so much that even just this one example, I'm so excited to ask you questions about right. it. But so <laughs> yeah. a, a couple of things jump out. One is I'm sure you've experienced this, but even your own fa a family member thought, oh, well, I'll just be done with Montessori after a year. And I know a lot of parents think, well, you know, they're getting yeah. some, but they can't really see what they're really gaining because it takes time. Mm. You know, it's a little bit of mm. distance. Um, and then the, yes. yeah. the big thing I want to ask is that even this example, mm. which to me is amazing, mm. like he's seen a shape mm. in, in almost nothing, mm. like it's the absence yes. of, you know, but yeah. for parents out there, why is that meaningful? Like, you know, parents like, oh, okay. So he sees a triangle and then, like, wh why mm. is that so meaningful in your mind for ch a child's development? Mm. I feel then it's in his heart, like, you know, in his head intellectually cognitively it's there and it doesn't go away so mm -hmm. that when that happens you know it's like a discovery for the child you no know? he's discovering and applying what he's learned to his environment you know and i feel that if children parents are sensitive to or teachers also you know listening and observing i feel that uh, makes a difference to the child's learning in, in later life also mm -hmm. It lays a foundation. Now, don't you think so? Yeah. 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 No, definitely. I mean, on, on mine, I'm mm. just with parents out there. I mm. think sometimes the contrast, because we don't even think mm. in this way, it's like kids learn, oh, they learn shapes, mm. they learn triangles, square, circle. Mm. You might have a worksheet yeah. that yeah. shows yeah. the difference, they check mm. it off. But yes. what you're saying, Amuk, mm. is almost like it's mm. their own now. Like this is this is their own. It's, yes. not a teach, it's not a teacher giving them name the triangle from these yeah. four things and you get an A. It's like he mm. just he just saw he made a discovery yeah. of his own. Um, it's yes. funny because I'm yes. Yes. I'm in a yeah. I'm in a room right now and and the lamp is making mm. a shadow and whatever for whatever uh -huh. reason okay. that it's made a triangle on yeah. the wall. So I'm seeing this. Oh, I think wow. it's, <laughs> it's I think it's those type Lovely. of things that they kind of make mm. us more human yeah. where we can see things yes. in the world on our mm. own. Now, do you, yeah. I, I know you've dealt with a lot of, whether mm. it's public school children mm. or just children, uh, you know, mm. on the mm. streets kind of, yeah. Yeah. this seems mm. to be an exciting discovery when children learn in this way, mm. when it's, when it's their own. Have you mm. seen the difference mm. over the years between a child learning, say triangles in a traditional way versus mm. shapes mm. and so forth in Montessori or anything really in this kind of approach? Yeah. I find, uh, you know, sometimes when, uh, so children going to conventional schools or mainstream schools. Um, when we ask them a question, we're discussing. Uh, they say, oh, I was not taught this, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's their reaction, their response sometimes. Oh, I don't know this. I didn't learn it in school. My teacher did not tell me. But a Montessori child will go further and say, you know, try to discuss about it and uh, know something about it. They're not focused on the teacher or the somebody teaching them you know that is secondhand baggage in a sense you know so people are just waiting to be told something and that mindset is formed in very early in convention schools yeah and because they're learning by rote the teachers all the time telling them so even at home sometimes parents become teachers you know and are instructional to to the children so all this is like a child being a consumer, to see the child as a consumer. But if you see the child as a constructor, he's creating his own uh, baggage of knowledge, to, so to say, then uh, it's such a different experience for the child because he's uh, independent. And he's learning and thinking independently. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibility of you know, discussion with the, anybody. He's not waiting to be told things. Another example. Uh, a child, uh, we were introducing the, the Montessori uh, approach and the method in a, in a village setting. And we set up a, like a tent and where we put up all the material. And the children were street children, working children. So there was a child who came up. We were just about 10 days doing that. And the child came up and uh, he was doing numbers, etc. So I was showing some material to the visitors and then he was there wanting to show also. So he was part of that discussion. 
So then I asked him, uh, give me zero, you know. Hmm. So he gave me some beads. He was youngish, you know. So uh, he gave me some beads. So I said, this is not zero. This is five or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then again, I said, give me zero. And he gave me something else, you know, number odd. Uh, then I said, this is six, whatever he's given me. I said, give me zero and let you think about it and tell me. So in the next couple of days, whenever he saw me, you know, he would look at me and I said, okay, you want to give me a zero? And uh, he, he didn't do that. But on the third day, uh, he brought the sandpaper, you know, numerals of a zero. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to me with a big smile, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Finally, he found a way to give me that zero. Yeah, He was about... Uh, 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 six years old or seven years old because he mm. was coming straight from a you know being on the street yeah so that that i feel is uh, you know wonderful when things happen like that yeah that's such a i mean that's a beautiful story and i know you know their parents are always yeah. oh, six or seven he's just getting zero but so maybe yeah. i know you've been in this yeah. for so long i hear often in in america here but in de definitely in other yeah, places yeah. around the world more mm -hmm. modern parents mm -hmm. are very concerned I, I oh is it too late mm -hmm. to get my child in, and you know the child might be mm -hmm. three years old you know they're very stressed mm -hmm. about it yeah so can yeah. you maybe talk about with your experience and what you've seen with children coming in and getting this approach even at a later age and how quickly they can grow mm -hmm. and even at yes, a later age, yeah. can you talk? I mean, you just gave an example, yeah. but I'm curious your experience now with that. Mm -hmm. See, even in the elementary school, I mean, very often even the teachers who are trained say only if they come with the CASA experience, the three to six experience in a Montessori, they can, you know, be part of the elementary class. Mm -hmm. But I feel that, uh, you know, we talk about uh, helping children to be themselves true to their nature you know, normalizing in uh, courts for parents. And uh, even in the elementary level, when they come in, I feel there's there's a huge possibility of helping them to be, learn in an integrated way, be integrated. And, uh, you know, the integrated I mean by, you know, working with their head, heart and hand in a, in a simultaneous way. It's not just intellectual or cognitive which doesn't stay with them. So I feel uh, even at the pre-primary or elementary, if children come in directly, we can help them. So say like one example, I mean, maybe kind of a very stark example. A, a girl came in when she was into the elementary, when she was eight years old, her parents were transferred and they found the Montessori Abacus School where I was the principal. And uh, she... Uh, this girl, if we called her, she would run the other way because she was used to a regular school where teachers always scolded her. And she thought if they, if a teacher called her, she would just run the other way. And so then uh, slowly, that was in the first one month, she was like that. So she would just run and go. And slowly then she created bonds with the teachers created bonds with me, and then became comfortable in the school. You know? So that's, uh, you know, the reaction of uh, a child of being in a conventional school and then coming into a Montessori environment is uh, can be helped because then they emotionally, it's a kind of healing process that they need to go through, and then they'll be okay. Another example was in the uh, same... Uh, in a pre-primary environment, she, the child came in when she was about uh, three and a half or four. And uh, she would uh, bring, you know, like one piece from the cylinder blocks, one piece from the number odd and play like house house. Mm -hmm. you know, so then we asked her to, you know, choose one material. We were presenting material to her, pink tower, you know, language material, etc. cetera. Uh, but that idea of choosing was not there for her. Mm -hmm. So we said, why don't we put out three kind of materials and said, choose from here. And then she turned around and told me, uh, they used to call us Auntie or Akka. Auntie, I don't know how to choose. You know, this four-year-old, 
could say that. I don't know how to choose. And that was, you know, uh, communication between me and her. And then we helped her. I said, may I help you to do that? Yeah. You know, so uh, then that started a process of learning for her. I yeah. feel just uh, how could she say that, you know? Yeah. The adults don't know, I can't say that, but she was after two, three months in the monastery environment, could say that, that courage she had to say, you know, to say. That. It was uh, emotional also, you know, at that time. Yeah. I mean, it's, for her it, and for me. Yeah, because I, you know, we're going to be talking about kind of the intellectual development of a child, but I, I don't think you can separate out the emotional intellectual kind of you, we were talking about before with the, the heart, because, yes. you know, if you grow that yeah. way intellectually, you, you feel it in a mm. deep way. Um, mm. So mm. I, I'm wondering, you, you said a term, you said two terms, but you said second handed and you raised the term mm. baggage. So, uh, mm. you know, I, I, what I want to get into is I want to understand how you see, you know, what the Montessori approach is to, to knowledge and how children, you know, gain or mm. learn. I, mm. In the way that you're talking, and I've kind of thought about it is traditionally or conventionally throughout history, we had this sense mm -hmm. that kind of there's the world out there, there's a teacher, and then the teacher mm -hmm. kind of teaches the child about the world. Like, I'm going to show mm -hmm. you this. And, you know, I've kind of thought about like Martin Luther with the Protestant Reformation when he he said, mm -hmm. you know, whether this is right or wrong religiously, but this is kind of an analogy um, where he said mm -hmm. people can see God themselves. They don't need an intermediary. Mm -hmm. They don't need a middleman. And in that case, it was yeah. the Pope. Yes. Um, yeah, and it, yeah. to me, Montessori seems to be that revolutionary figure who said, you don't need the teacher to tell you what the world is. She can help you. Like, you know, you might have a, somebody help you to understand different things, but you're, you're seeing the world for yourself with your own eyes. Um, I wonder if, you know, do you see that as a good analogy for what Montessori, what makes it unique in terms of how yes. we approach knowledge or how do you, how do you hold it in your mind? And, and when you're talking to parents and teachers, how do you explain mm. the difference? Mm. I feel say even in India, the, you know, the learning tradition, people think it's only repetitive, but uh, the guru or the teacher you know, people now know the idea of a guru, uh, yoga or dance or, you know, any other form. Mm -hmm. So, or a religious, spiritual journey also. So there always was a, a focus on the individual and the individual's uh, process of learning. So then this send them on tasks, you know, okay, and questions, raise questions and they have, the student had to find the answer. Or, or a way of approaching, you know, that answer. So that it was not all the time told to them. Mm. So they learned some things and uh, some things they had to discover for themselves and come to that. So I feel Montessori is in tune with that. In a sense, we have to reveal, I mean, the presentation is, I feel, uh, a kind of a revelation. I feel that presentation time is sacred. So when you really reveal the material or the what is the concept in the material, that is a presentation and uh, what to do with it. So after that, the pro time the child takes to work with the material, the time we present to the children is only five minutes or so. But the work the child does with that material and that concept is over the year. And uh, then what is in the material is transferred, we say, to the child. You know, that's the abstractness of the material. Whatever is in the material comes to the child as the child works. So I feel that uh, uniqueness in the Montessori is to allow that point of, uh, for the child to come to that point of discovery. So, and that is first-hand knowledge, you know, if you, going back to your question. And second-hand is what you have just been told. Why tell a child that uh, you know the that this is a formula and leave it at that? Why not yeah. uh, help the child to discover a formula? You know, so, like uh, we do that for even algebra. One of the reasons I ask is I think it's hard for some parents. Mm -hmm. um, I know definitely in the kind of Western tradition to understand mm -hmm. how profound Montessori is because 
It's like, well, you know, maybe I can send them this other school and they learn, they quote, learn the same amount, but they've just memorized Mm -hmm. something. And I think if we think historically, how many errors have continued through centuries, because people just, you know, they listened to what somebody Mm -hmm. else wrote in a book and they repeated it, but it was wrong because they didn't, they didn't look at it for, with their own eyes, their own, they didn't hear it, you know, they didn't see it. So, um, I know, mm. you, you know, Montessori, we, we've got a definite sense that the children mm. start with their mm. senses, with their eyes, mm. with their ears, with their mm. hands. Mm. Can you talk mm. a little bit mm. about why it's so important that they're physically working with some of these materials, not just the teacher kind of telling mm. them things? Mm. Yeah. See, the Montessori approach looks at uh, the teacher being part of the environment and uh, not the, and there are many resources in the environment for where children learn from. So now there's not one teacher, each material is a teacher in a way. So so there's that many resources in the environment in the classroom. And uh, when children uh, learn, uh, it's not by memory, it's not the teacher telling them. Teacher only reveals that material in the presentation and the child uh, works with it. So, at the pre-primary level, when the child is, say, like three to six years old, or even earlier or later, but the hands in this age are very important as a learning material, as a learning tool. And uh, if you see even historically, children work with their hands. You know, so, and then the if you do not work with your hands, what is in your hands goes di- directly to the head. But if you try to, for a three to six year old, if you try teaching them, you know, this is a triangle or that's a five, just uh, writing on the board. It, it is just like they're parroting. It's not their knowledge. It is just somebody else's knowledge which comes to them. And uh, it's just information, not even knowledge. So the, then they're only parroting it. They're not, uh, it's not their own. They're repeating it by rote in a sense. It's just a memory. It's at the surface level, not at a deeper level. But if they work with their hand, it gets integrated and uh, it stays in their heart for, you know, uh, for their life. You, we use the word by hearting, you know, but uh, so in conventional schools, they by heart the table say. But whereas here we say we learn with the heart, not by heart, but with the heart. Mm. And so though all the three need to come together only then that integration happens and and whatever learning is not just for the next exam but it's for the it's for life and so how does that connect would you say with let's say some of the more practical life work in a montessori class versus what would normally be considered more academic materials mm. Yeah, in the Montessori environment, we have, you know, many materials. We say sensorial or practical life or maths or language. And the uh, practical life activities that we call them. It, uh, what is our activities that they see in the at home or see in the environment? And uh, like pouring water from one jug, jug to the glass or folding things, folding clothes, folding napkins. So there's a series of that in the practical life activities, which when the child does it, I mean, when you see a child coming in later and uh, not able to do it in elementary, you see the contrast of how children, when they're helped in the right way, can do it so beautifully. So I'll give you both, in a sense, instances when, say, elementary children come in without the practical life activities. They don't know how to, you know, they're clumsy about things. Mm -hmm. So they're not uh, graceful about uh, taking, picking up things, doing things. Things are all scattered all over the place. And they're not able to uh, even pour things. Even if they have to do lab work, they're not able to pour. So sometimes we keep some material in the elementary so that children become comfortable and graceful in doing things. Because often even now in the at homes, children are not allowed to do things on their own. They think it's dangerous to use a knife, dangerous to 
you know, use hot water. But if you tell them how to, children can do it. And uh, in Montessori, we have also knives, which are which can cut but are safe. And we show the children how to. Also in the exercise of practical life, what we have is uh, the sets are together. It says knife is there with the carrot they're going to cut. It's not that the knife is somewhere else and the carrots are somewhere else. If the scissors is there, the paper is there for them to cut. Not that the, they're in a different place. So when the set is there, the child kind of focuses on that. And when the, the EPL material also helps them to uh, calm them down, somehow that happens, it calms them down. When they're in a rush or feeling agitated, many of the children choose exercise of practical life, even in the elementary level. You know, and in the adolescent level, the same kind of work is seen as, uh, you know, working with the land, growing things, and doing economic projects. So this approach of Montessori's uh, working with the hands goes right up to uh, 18 years old, from birth to 18. So for each stage, there's a different way of working with the hands, but uh, working with the hands seems to be integral to learning and deep learning. So that's how she has seen it, and that's how it's practiced. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. Don't you think you, so? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, mm-hmm. I I'm in complete agreement. I'm I'm curious. You know, yeah. there's tradition, obviously historically, about a separation between the mind and the body um, in some mm-hmm. philosophy, mm-hmm. and then you know, kind of the Platonic mm-hmm. is the separation, and then maybe more of a Aristotelian yes. where there's a connection. Do you, do you in India have this, I know in America, there's this kind of, you know, like the scientist is this, he's very Mm -hmm. intellectual, but he'll trip, he'll trip over the doorway or something. And then Mm -hmm. the, the, the man or the, the, really usually it's manly, but it's this, you know, the jock, Mm -hmm. the, the, the physical Mm -hmm. athlete, he's very good physically, but he's kind of mentally stupid. You know, mm. do you guys mm. have that yes. um, generally that, that kind mm. of thought in India as well? It's uh, not so apparent here in India. I mean, it's similar, but uh, I feel, say, like we have our cricketers and tennis players and sports people who are also, uh, you know, able to, to talk on TV, give advice mm-hmm. to children, have their own schools for children, uh, sports schools. So it's not seen, uh, athletes are not seen as dumb, you know, yeah. because uh, I feel here some integration happens somehow or the other, maybe not in schools, but, you know, the way we live. So yeah, guys, I think that much, contrasting thing is not there, you know. Much, much more proper. <laughs> I think there's an element of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think and I naturally, mean, I feel yeah. Indians are also curious, wanting to learn things, you know, yeah. by and large. Yeah, and I think that you, I mean, there used to be a, I would say, in the old, the, the early days of America, I think there was more of an integration where you know you were supposed to be a complete mm-hmm. human being. But mm-hmm. I, I think there was, yes. it became kind of just this this joke about you know mm-hmm. jocks are stupid, and then mm-hmm. and then with scientists, yes, yes. I think it's always it's kind of like the Socrates. I'm off in the clouds. Mm-hmm. I'm just mm-hmm. floating around. I'm yes. not really yeah. of the yeah. ground. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I kind of run into this often. Is mm-hmm. that in Montessori, we're trying to help children to learn in a in a certain mm-hmm. way or to come in contact with the world and understand it mm-hmm. better in a in a new and kind of a radical way because it just I don't think it was done mm-hmm. at least not consistently mm-hmm. as in Montessori, mm-hmm. but how mm-hmm. how do you see that as given that we're the, us teachers and parents most of us did not go through a kind of first handed approach mm-hmm. to learning so we have to mm-hmm. kind of do a lot of introspection a lot of relearning mm-hmm. in a new way mm-hmm. how do how do you see that over the years you've worked with adults and even yourself kind of in your own journey mm-hmm. how do you mm-hmm. overcome what what maybe we lo- missed as children mm-hmm. in order to aid children to do what we missed mm-hmm. How do you mm, see that? Yeah. Well, I feel being in the world of uh, teacher training, I feel that's our work that we do, is to help. Uh, I mean, a lot of healing has to happen from what they've gone through in school. So we look at that. We ask them to share their experience in school. And uh, 
help them to get over that you know because they have to <laughs> overcome that <laughs> get over <laughs> to be montessori montessori adults you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they talk about it how you know like one uh, teacher said she was so angry with the teachers that she could not even look at them you know and then the humiliation teachers have given you know given to them if you don't talk about this then the teachers will take this to the school and to the children you know but school because school is such a heavy structure in our minds in our imagination that you have to get out of that is difficult yeah so that healing process is there for adults i think we need to talk about it and say okay this is what is good about education system that we've gone through so that's one of our first workshops that we do for the teachers you know what is good and bad about uh, the present education system mm-hmm. or what is it that we can throw out what is it that you want to keep so that discussion is there you know right in the front uh-huh. and through the course i think we have to help them to say like when they learn fractions or uh, large numbers they don't know what is a billion or a million so it's a discovery process for them too mm-hmm. so at the practice time when we have practice time we help ask them to explore the material and learn for themselves not just repeat the presentations mm-hmm. you know so being exact to the presentation comes later but that exploration of the material is important and even for parents when i was running a school uh, when i was head of a school in chennai or uti we asked to invite parents to come and work with the material and they would make their own discoveries so i feel that's kind of a process of how to overcome what we have gone through yeah. to talk about it in a in a group and share that otherwise yes. we hold it too strongly inside even like parents who are into homeschooling mm-hmm. or you know unschooling uh, whatever is called so i ask them also why do you want to attach the name school to your what you're doing why not say learning because that again that you're taking the structure of the school into homeschooling yeah know? yeah yeah so it, it's interesting because i think even if you're not in montessori this type of going back and what you said mm-hmm. you know keeping what you want to keep and getting rid of what you don't want mm-hmm. from childhood i think every yeah, adult yeah, could gain yeah. from this but yes. uh yes. a couple things come to mind but one is I'm I'm noticing that it's it's become a trend and I think it's probably because the ease of it to mm. buy materials mm. for your children at home um mm. through mm. through different companies that are making materials that might be mm. very well and good materials yeah. but the parents mm. aren't going through that kind of real introspective process or even you know really getting the materials for themselves as adults and exploring and learning mm. as you were saying discovering mm. Mm. have you seen mm. that more broadly in Montessori that it's just, it, it seems to be the, it's moving towards this materials. Oh, if I just get these quote Montessori materials, then I'm doing Montessori. Mm. Um, mm. Have you seen that? And do you see that? I'm assuming you would see that as a problem if they're not mm. going through this, yes. this inner yeah. work and so mm. forth. Yeah. Especially during COVID time, you know, and to see the materials also as only academic and see Montessori learning as only academic, you yeah. know, so the pe- parents are impressed how children learn you know a whole lot of things in montessori and they want to take it to their home during covid time and maybe homeschooling and others also do that but i feel that's again limiting oneself to academics and teaching them through the materials the materials become didactic you know rather they're not learning materials for the child in the environment so often we tell parents you can't take you know the it has to be in a social environment where they're choosing where they're learning but montessori in the say the esf program educators on frontiers mm-hmm. has done a lot of work I, i heard in africa and other places where they're taking montessori home in a nice way where there's a choice and so instead of a shelf maybe a shelf is there but if there's no shelf also 
a runner a table runner is kept and those are the materials for the week yeah you know so some of those principles of montessori i think have to be you know even at home like it has to be a choice and yeah. if possible have other children also there do is the parent and the child teaching i feel is the parents need to go through some kind of exercises to you know the otherwise yeah. they expect too much from their child Yeah and I don't I don't want to you know make it seem like I'm saying oh a parent working with their child is the issue I mean cuz you could I know there's I've yes. been in Montessori classrooms where the teacher they have all the materials mm-hmm. but the teacher's never gone mm-hmm. through the work that you were talking about yes. and that's just as problematic so um mm-hmm. it's more mm-hmm. of a sense that today the the mm-hmm. approach what does it mean to have a Montessori mindset in a way or to like really mm-hmm. be be in mm-hmm. it um I think mm-hmm. materials are very easy to say oh well I've got the materials yes. but um yeah. yes. if you if you don't really grasp some of the kind of the foundational mm-hmm. elements which we're talking about with the mm-hmm. you know starting mm-hmm. with the senses but mm-hmm. as well that that work mm-hmm. that you said as a human being you have to go back and mm-hmm. you know really look mm-hmm. at what's happening now do you mm-hmm. you know it's it was funny that you used the term like you got to get over it like i can just imagine i mean people can't see a mm-hmm. moment but I'll, maybe i'll just get a picture of you up there so yeah. but i'm imagining yes. you like almost slapping yeah. a lady <laughs> you get over it <laughs> i mean i know that's not the that's not the way you do it obviously yeah. but i mean i've seen this in my own life uh, as a as a journey and a process there is no oh mm-hmm. i took the montessori training and now i've i'm mm-hmm. done like mm-hmm. you know i i've i've figured mm-hmm. everything out mm-hmm. yes. is yeah. that has that yeah. been your experience or do you think that there's a certain type of training where you can just you know figure it all out amongst this little group in a year mm-hmm. or or what not mm-hmm. what, what's your take yeah sometimes i feel like you know when the teachers come out out of courses they are kind of very proud that they've finished it and the some arrogance is there you know so that they've all got this wonderful uh, course but i often tell them that uh, you know there's so much more to it you know our personhood every day what we tell the children uh, our personhood is there you know so we have to also work on that and uh, if they again in the course if this all no discovery but everything is told to them i feel those are the changes we need to make in our training pro courses also uh, because once they come into the they've learned all this in the course but when they come into an environment again as you said the material is a focus the presentations are a focus but what about the child social development what about the child being you know normalized as we say you know being true to their nature and the spiritual journey of the child also you know how we integrate that and help them to be themselves be themselves by themselves and also in the group so i feel all that is also so important and uh, whether we need to focus on that so that learning becomes again you know wholesome and integrated rather than uh, children being only looking at their academic achievements yeah we have to look at the child's development you know so i say development is our aim you know not just uh, the child's development is our aim and goal mm. in the a montessori class not just academic learning i mean they yeah. may be brilliant in some things you know we appreciate it but that's not our aim our aim is the child's development no point having a fantastic intellectual you know person without uh, you know being socially adjusted socially you know contributing to society and you, you I, i'm thinking about what you're saying now and you kind of started with that the child with the triangle that saw that of yeah. his own accord i wonder mm. if monastery seems to be that integration between what seemingly is called the academic is a child who just knows so mm-hmm. much knowledge mm-hmm. and so forth and then the mm-hmm. what i found the other side is kind of the 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 child who who almost lived i find it often when children are living in poverty mm-hmm. or they don't have mm-hmm. rich parents is there mm-hmm. tends to be mm-hmm. they're more independent they're more self-driven mm-hmm. i mean they have mm-hmm. incredible limitations mm-hmm. that's unfortunate such as mm-hmm. you know the academic mm-hmm. but they they mm. can just take care of things whereas 
the intellectual mm-hmm. or the academic achiever mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. more conventional school, mm-hmm. you know, if you ask them mm-hmm. to make a sandwich for himself, he or herself, they mm-hmm. would be lost. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. curious, given your experience with more kind of impoverished mm-hmm. people in India, I know I've gotten a lot mm-hmm. of commentary from mm-hmm. impoverished children in Africa who kind of, mm-hmm. who grew out mm-hmm. of it. And they're like, well, a lot mm-hmm. of this in Montessori, uh, I grew up with mm-hmm. a lot of this and it wasn't Montessori, but mm-hmm. I would, you know, the more practical life yeah. stuff. Do you, yeah, have you seen yeah. that in your work with uh, some of the people, mm. the, the more poor neighborhoods and, mm. and areas? Yes. In India? Yeah, we're working with, uh, you know, street children, working children, and uh, also in uh, uh, what is called, um, you know, Anganwadi in India, that is a, a place for birth to six years old, for mm. poor children to come. We've done some work there also. So, the children, in a way, when they come, they value what uh, is there, you know, because they don't have the materials, that they're respectful to the materials. They're more uh, wholesome, in a way, because they've been doing that. And they take to Montessori very, very quickly and adapt to that. We've done that in government schools also, where the children uh, in the city of Chennai where the poorest of the poor go to the government schools. Others have the choice of private schools, etc. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, low fee also, low fee schools too. But when in the government schools, when the poorest of the poor go there, that uh, when we introduce Montessori up, uh, method there and Montessori activity and, and the idea of Montessori there, where children had a choice, where children could work, there too the children took to these kind of activities oh, very quickly and this they get normalized also very quickly that uh, separation is not there whereas uh, often in the people who are more well to do they don't want to put their bags away because at home they're too inst- uh, you know been instructed all the time uh, to put their things away or whatever mm-hmm. the children sometimes don't want to do those things Rebel but slowly them. when they uh, see how children are doing, they take up one or two and how it helps them, mm-hmm. it becomes a norm. So even when for adolescents, say, like working with mud, working on earth, they don't want to touch mud, some of the people from the well-to-do <laughs> families, because they, <laughs> they think it's dirty. That's the idea, you know. Uh... <laughs> so that idea of mud being dirty, you know, we have to take that idea out of their heads yeah and that's i i I wonder if you guys because in i i'm finding in in american culture and i know this is in some other kind of more uh, modernized european type uh cultures Mm -hmm. there's just such a focus on poor versus rich and i find that you know the limitations that each of us have as Mm -hmm. individuals as you were kind of talking about when you have to Mm -hmm. go back into your childhood in a way Mm -hmm. you never know what it's going to be because uh, you know that Mm -hmm. the idea of like i can't touch mud because that's dirty Mm -hmm. that's an enormous Mm -hmm. limitation but it you know that's coming from a a wealthy family Mm -hmm. so i Mm -hmm. i i tend to look at these things in montessori as like we try to find what our baggage is, whether we were poor, rich, mm. this or that. It's what's your mm. individual mm. limitation. Mm. And yes. I just, it mm. seems like a lot of our limitation was that we we never got a chance to look at the world for ourselves. It was some other person, mm. you know, mm. telling us what the world is like. Mm. And I just, I don't know, yeah. it seems like kind of getting back mm. to the, the senses and even that mm. triangle that you started with. Mm. Um, mm. Do you, do you see in the Montessori Mm-hmm. you know, that I know she focuses a lot on the individual, but the individual within a community, mm-hmm. do you, maybe that focus on the community and the community values versus an individual mm-hmm. looking at the world mm-hmm. for himself. And then, cause it, it, mm-hmm. let me maybe get my thoughts together here. From my mm-hmm. understanding of Montessori and my experience, it seems like the child first has to have a contact with the world and an enjoyment of these discoveries, as you talk mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. they can, get that more social sense of, oh, I care about my neighbor and so forth. It just seems like Mm -hmm. the the most important foundation is, do Mm -hmm. I have a connection Mm -hmm. with the world? And and am Mm -hmm. I discovering things? Mm -hmm. Am I understanding? Is that Mm -hmm. your sense? Or do Mm -hmm. you think they need a a community first? Or is it an integration? Mm -hmm. How do you see it? Mm -hmm. 
No, I feel if we go through the child development, if we go through that, and that's our base, and Montessori always took that as a base, what is, what's happening to the child? So the three to six-year-old is uh, an individual. He's becoming an individual. So we have to support him in that, him or her in that, being an individual. And also is uh, is there, he's part of the community. We have so many, you know, because the environment is made that way, the Montessori environment, where you have to take care of others too, in a natural way, in a normal setting. So they're aware, but that support to being an individual is important at the three to six. And the, and the six to 12 in the second plane, when the children are six years to 12 years, they have become individuals, they're confident about themselves. And now they're looking out to the other to, you know, to integrate or to collaborate. So in the elementary, many of the presentations are group presentations. Whereas in the pre-primary, in the CASA, it is individual presentations. So that's how Montessori, you know, based her work on children also. And, and you can see in the elementary how if they have a Montessori background in the pre-primary, they're able to collaborate, they work with each, each other, discuss, have a conversation. So the, we found that, uh, we did some observations recently. We found that in the, in the elementary classroom, if there's more like a, you know, a hum of activity and children are talking, et cetera, there's more concentration happening. Children are mm. involved in concentration if there is that talking going on. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the, when in the casa and the pre-primary, they need to be quiet. And when there's a quietness, they concentrate more. They get disturbed with noise from other children. Mm -hmm. So if you go and walk into a Montessori environment, a pre-primary is usually very, very quiet, you know, because children want that, that age group. But if you go into the elementary, children are, you know, it's buzzing with activity. This, uh, and so some children sometimes, or teachers, when they come into the elementary, Montessori teachers come in from Casa and they say there's so much noise here, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, yeah. but that's the, that's the need of the child at that age. There is a difference and uh, children uh, also, I appreciate the world. I feel at the younger age, if you look at plants and you're looking at animals, learning about them, so much more of the wonderful world is opened out, you yeah. know, not just uh, books and uh, ABC and one, two, mm -hmm. three. You know, so the whole world is the keys. We say we're giving keys to the world, to the young child. And uh, to the older child, we're giving them the keys to the universe because that is their learning. That's where they are. Yeah. And the... The, the, the quote noise contrast or i would put it as a contrast mm. you're talking about is like mm. you know it's not like a casa class or a pre, they're silent it's not you know like what people might think of as quiet but in contrast mm. to an elementary classroom it's almost like it sounds silent because the elementary is mm. i mean these children are really having discussions and they're working i you yes. know you hear a lot that the kind of contrast is you've got in casa you've got children kind of working at the same table mm. talking, but they're not really talking about the same project. They're kind of just in their own little world yeah. possibly. Yeah. But in elementary, yes. they're literally yeah. collaborating on, yeah. on activities. Yes. Um, yeah. Call it also parallel play for the younger children. You know, they're sitting together, <laughs> maybe doing the same Pattern activity play. also, yeah. <laughs> but they're in their, as you said, in their own world. And yeah. we can't help. Very often parents say there's no group work in the pre-primary. Mm -hmm. you know but because that's the way the children are you know yeah so we have to take the nature of the child into account yeah i think that's yeah, why sorry, I was... you were going to say no something. i think no that's that's i'm happy you said that because that's i think what i was why i was getting at mm -hmm. that is because i think a lot of parents they want to they, you know they want to say oh i need my child needs to be more social my child needs to be more sweet and it's mm -hmm. like that that will come but yet that i'm talking at the younger mm -hmm. ages but it will come based on their nature. And as you were just saying, so I think that's why mm. I was raising it to mm. see, you know, mm. we're talking about yes. how children yeah. develop and, you know, sweetness doesn't mm. come in a, in a vacuum, you know, you mm. don't just become sweet out yes. of nowhere. Yeah. Because yeah, if they go to a birthday party, you know, parents want them to be, 
you know, happy and uh, jumping about and talking to everybody. Yes. You know? But every child is not like that. Yes. And at that age, they they take their time to, you know, be okay yeah. with that. And that's a great, that's a great example. Cause I think that's at a core level, it's allowing that child to develop at his own, you know, natural pace. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But to help them, I feel to come there, uh, what the, we do house visits, you know, so five, about 10 children say, visit each other's houses. So we, mm-hmm. in the term, maybe about three houses, homes they visit mm-hmm. and the child who's the host, uh, you know, we'll welcome them and you know all that because we also yeah. teach social graces at the pre-primary, and so to help them to kind of apply it in thing, this home visits also helps a lot. And so, and the children how they go and you know to welcome to eat together and all that in a different in a home setting. In the school, yeah. they're able to do that because we help them with that, you know. And in the house, it is a little more difficult. So we try to make this uh, uh, activity of home visits important for, we don't take the whole class, but a few. Mm -hmm. I feel that helps a lot. Yeah, and I don't think that that's going, I haven't seen a lot of schools where that type of thing is going Mm on. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think your general point about aiding in that process versus Mm-hmm. So I think the conventional mm-hmm. approach is, you know, at a young age, you don't really get that. You get, if a child's doing something wrong, then you might get a punishment or, mm-hmm. Hey, you need to change. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not an ongoing, yeah. how do you interact with, you know, your mm-hmm. peers? And it's, um, you know, in my, in my remembrance of this, it was like, as you get more, you get older, even like fifth or sixth grade, you would just have these, mm-hmm. these big group, maybe all school meetings where somebody would come in and teach you. Yeah. Like this Mm. is how you're a good person, you know? Mm. So I think even, Mm. even that with Montessori is much more practical. It's much Mm. more real and hands-on. Like if a child bumps you, Mm. what do you do when a child Mm. bumps you, you know? Yes. Um, So I'm happy you even raised that. And instead of reacting and being aggressive, I feel the social graces are also important the way we approach in Montessori. Mm. And the other is uh, when, you know, we give them talk about, uh, to say sorry, thank you, etc. You know, so there's no need to be aggressive in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody does something to you, and to be able to be say no and refuse, all those are part of yeah. you know the Montessori culture. Yeah, so it's kind of like you were the talking about the, is, the presentations, but these are mm-hmm. these are presentations in a different way or lessons that you help a child to learn how to deal with his social interactions. Yes. Yeah. And the other is also, I think, what helps children is we have individual kind of work, group work, and collective. You mm. know, so they understand how to be a member in each and how to interact in, yeah. you know, when you're a one to one, when you're in a small group, or when you're in a collective. Yeah. Once I was observing a school, and the children in the, in the uh, I think they were just gone into elementary. So they knew how to be in the collective and the whole class was there. You know, they raised their hands, they spoke one by one, etc. Mm-hmm. But in a small group, they became very giggly and, uh, you know, very uh, couldn't uh, talk to each other. So I was asking the teacher what's happening. So she said that, you know, over the term, they hadn't had enough of group work. You know, so they didn't know how mm-hmm. to be a member in a group. Yeah. They were okay being in a collective and then as an individual. So yeah. that group work also is important. And uh, all three are important. You know, how to be a member. Yeah. So we are co- members of a collective, maybe a, a club or, a, you know, a discussion group or a country also. So how do we, we don't have, we can influence, uh, uh, you know, that uh, where we are, but how do we do that? Yeah. How do we interact? being a part of a collective, being part of a group, or as an individual. I feel yeah. that experience that children have uh, helps them to be in the world outside. Yeah, because if you and, have no uh, experience with it, then how could you ever succeed? I yes, mean, you're yeah. not going to succeed if you have no experience with it. Yes, yeah. So um, to, to be able we, to talk oh. to each other, you no, know, look at the eyes and talk to one another, I feel that's so important in a monastery environment. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's funny you say that because when when I was transitioning from a kind of traditional, more conventional mm -hmm. school teacher to a Montessori mm -hmm. teacher, uh, that was one of the things that kind of jumped out. Is like when we started to think, well, how much time do these children in their classes where they go from math and the bell rings, and they go to history, the bell rings. Mm -hmm. How much time do they actually have interacting with each other without a teacher around making sure everything's fine? And it was it was something like an maybe 45 minutes because it was just during snack or, or lunch, you know? Yes, yeah. That's all. It, it's so it's I'm I'm happy you raised these kind of three different types mm. of experiences because mm. in mm. a conventional school, you're really lacking in a lot of mm. these different interactions yeah. that are organic versus and a teacher led. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. And they're treated as a herd, you know. Yes. So yeah, the, it's a, <laughs> not as individual children. It's yeah. changing, but uh, they're always seen as a class and as a batch, and you know, yeah. as a not as an <laughs> individual kind yeah. of thing. So I say it's a, like a herd, you know. <laughs> No, that's Whether a good. You that's see a good, the individual sheep there. I'm not yes, sure. Yes, yeah. it's a good. Vi no, it's. A, I think it's a good visual. The herd. We see cattle or mm -hmm. sheep. Yes, but the herd. Mm -hmm. The herd mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So Mukta, we've we've covered a, a lot. So we've we uh, we kind of gone way over, but it's good. So got mm -hmm. got through a mm -hmm. bunch. Is there anything you kind of you yeah. know that we haven't talked about that you want to get out there to people about Montessori about the approach anything that we haven't covered before we head out? Yeah. I feel uh, even this learning is so deep that, you know, there's so many stages in that learning that uh, we need to cover. You know, Aristotle talked about it long ago. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy talks about it. You know, so I feel it's, uh, and Montessori, of course, talks about it. So the stages of learning are important, I feel, and children uh, and parents, children need to have that experience and parents too need to recognize parents or Montessori teachers also need to recognize that these stages need to go through a sensorial experience where you know children are touching and seeing and doing things with their hands and legs and eyes and everything. And then you know there's a stage where Aristotle talks about of uh, you know it becomes when the material is not there, you know it's away. still that image is there in the mind. They're not touching it, but the image is there. That image also is a thing, you know, then it's still not abstract enough. So, but when they apply it, you know, then it becomes uh, an, a, a learning for themselves and it stays with them. I'll give you an example, a, a little child, my grandniece, she was about two years old and uh, she had seen, uh, we had gone to, we we're having a party in a, a lawn and uh, she saw this huge uh, bin and uh, suddenly she realized that it was a waste paper basket kind of a thing, which is at home, but this is different. So the then she asked everybody for their napkins, each one, and went and put it there. Because this was, she was applying what she had uh, seen, you know, that's an abstraction of a mm -hmm. waste paper basket in her head, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and she was... Uh, went up and down that putting napkins into that bin. You know, she would have gone at least 15 times. Then people, if, uh, you know, then all the tissues were over. So she sat next to the bin and uh, to, to, uh, dug out some stones and all that and mm -hmm. put it into the bin. I mean, that was her discovery, I feel, and that abstraction, you know, that fourth stage where you apply your mm -hmm. experience to to the world, you know. So do you see? I feel that's yeah something that yeah. I mean, going back to kind of some of what we talked about, do you see this as like tr conventional school or the kind of memorization approach is 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 jumping over the earlier stages of that learning process, and you're just mm -hmm. kind of memorizing the the concept or the yeah. word for things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, memorizing, learning by rote, also being just instructed and repeating, parroting. You know, so you're staying at that level of learning where it's possible to go deeper, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a surface level. So much is there. Children are possible. We are underestimating what children are capable of and, and human beings also. Yeah. So that learning becomes, uh, you know, if it's deeper and real, 
I feel that we can do it in so many ways, you know, at home or in schools yeah. and turn things around. Yeah, just thinking about the integration you talked about earlier with just the heart that there's a, it's a mm-hmm. joyous process. I think we all know as as human beings that we've gone through. We know when we really know mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. oh yes. yeah, I learned I learned that in in ninth grade chemistry, but you really don't know it. You just memorized some definition. Yes, um, and it's yes. just such a it's such a different experience and so much more joyous when mm-hmm. it's when it's yours. Like that triangle, mm-hmm. that's his. That's that's mm-hmm. not you know yeah. I I. I filled yeah. in a bubble on a Scantron test and and now I forgot yeah. Yeah. even what I, you know, so. Yeah. Well, awesome, Amukta. This is this has been fun. Um, yes. I'm, I'm happy we connected. Okay. I know yeah. one of your, uh, what was it? Yes. One of your students reached out to me is, or is she one of the employees yes. that works with you? Yeah, she's a faculty on the course, okay. on a pre-primary course. And yeah. so she listens to your podcast every day, she says. <laughs> When she's taking a walk. <laughs> it's a lot of days. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, she's so happy to be in touch with you. Thank you for coming yeah. on the show. Yeah. So. Yeah. I hope it's yeah fine and we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And as we talked about Amuta, I'll, I'll see about, um, I was speaking with Amuta about, she was saying that maybe do something visual, like she has, you know, a classroom there and we can do, but mm-hmm. I thought with the podcast going to be tough, but maybe something in the future, where we actually do a video together and, mm-hmm. and make that happen. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. so thank you again for coming on and, and yes, I'm sure you. we'll talk again. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'm happy to be with you. All right. Coming out of the discussion, I am not really going to add anything to it. Uh, we had a pretty lengthy convo, so I want to leave it there. I do want to note, if you enjoyed this discussion, if you're enjoying the show, the Montessori Education Podcast, please, please, please share it, subscribe wherever you listen. You can now contribute if you'd like, all sorts of things you can do, get it out there, uh, help us reach more and more people. Now, if you want to actually contact Amukta and learn more about her work, you can visit www.schoolscape.org, and scape is S-C-A-P-E. To reach me, Jesse McCarthy, as always, you can visit MontessoriEducation.com. I did want to note, I think I mentioned in the last episode about bringing on something new, and I'm going to be getting to that in the next episode, as I didn't want to kind of focus on what I'm up to on what's rightfully Amukta's episode here. And kind of on that note, thank you again to Amukta Mahapatra, another of the rare OG rock stars, and this one out in India. If you don't know what OG means, maybe it's time to do some first-handed Googling. Uh, Okay, take care, everyone, and adios until next time.